So welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk series. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Hugo Araujo. Hugo has been with us since the beginning of this project. Uh, he's a postdoctoral um, research associate at King's College London, and his interest is in conformance testing. He has done his PhD in this area, and he's continuing his research on uh, testing uh, robotic and autonomous systems, and also looking at the result of testing and using causality to explain the results of testing and verification. And he will be talking about his research in these areas uh, today. Thank you very much, Hugo. Uh, and just uh, for the benefit of all people here, the, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want your name to appear um, on the YouTube um, film, you could join us as a guest uh, and turn off your camera and it should be fine. Thanks again, Hugo, and uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, so in this talk, I'm going to present some um, research we've been doing in the past uh, year, two years or so, uh, with Mohammed as well. Uh, uh, it's basically applying conformance testing and applying notions of causal analysis into the domain of cyber physical systems. Uh, basically, the overall and main contribution of our work is we develop a causal analysis for cyber physical systems and use it to uncover the causes for counterexamples uh, of failures that were resulted from the verification techniques. Uh, the causal analysis is uh, by the, the theory of causal analysis is originated by the Hopper and Perrault's uh, theory for actual cause. Sorry, uh, for actual cause um, for discrete systems. We extended this theory for cyber physical systems and continuous systems in general. And then we also use conformance testing, uh, we think model based testing uh, as a verification process. So we combine those to have a smooth process where we generate inputs, we generate test cases, we find failures, and then we co uncover the causes for those failures. Uh, in the first half of the presentation, I'm going to focus on the cause analysis process. And in the second half, I'm going to focus on the verification techniques that you use. And then we combine them to, to show you the overall picture of the, the process that we have um, designed. Um, let's start with a small discrete running example so that I can explain the theory. Uh, so you consider two autonomous vehicles, they are driving on a road and there is a pedestrian situated at the end of the road. And if neither of these vehicles uh, turn right, then they are gonna hit the pedestrian. So the idea is that if one of the if the vehicle turn right, then it won't hit the pedestrian. Otherwise, if it does not turn right, if it goes straight ahead, then it's going to hit the pedestrian. So let's assume the situation that the pedestrian was hit. So now we wanted to find the cause for that, uh, given this very simple uh, discrete system. So the way to do that first, we need to find and build a causal model. Uh, a causal model basically represents uh, the modeling of your systems. Uh, in the causal model, we have the variables uh, that are in the systems, and we have a structural equations that uh, dictate how the variables behave. For example, um, assume there are there's these five variables in these uh, simple discrete systems. Uh, the variable for the green turns, if the green car turns. The variable for blue turns, if the blue car turns. The green collision, blue collision, uh, both of those for the, the collision, if either car uh, hits the pedestrian and the variable pedestrian is it. So what we do is uh, we build, we have the variables and you have the structural equations that tell us how the variables behave. For example, green collision is true if green does not turn, turn right, otherwise it's false. And it's the same for the blue collision. Blue collision is true if the blue car, car turns, do, uh, does not turn. Uh, and then we have the variable for the pedestrian head, and its equation says that it's true if either of the cars are collide. Uh, if either collision is true, then the pedestrian is hit. Otherwise, it's false. So uh, in order to analyze, analyze uh, causality, uh, we first build this causal model that detects how the variables behave, right? And our analysis is based on counterfactuals. I'm basically saying if green had turned right, then blue would have hit the pedestrian or something like that. You, you build a sentence, uh, a structural sentence uh, to determine 
uh, your cause. Uh, more specifically, what we do is we use uh, Boolean predicates. We say, for example, uh, the pedestrian hit equals to true. This is your effect. And the cause for that, an example of a cause could be, for example, that green turns equals to false. Uh, so let's assume that this here on the right is the current evaluation for your variables. We have that the green turns equals to false, blue turns equals to true. So only the green turn, only the blue car turns right. And then the green collides with the pedestrian, uh, the blue does not, and the pedestrian hit. So given this causal model and this valuation of the variables, what would be the cause for that? In order to do that, we uh, help and impose the device three clauses. Uh, the three clauses basically tell you that uh, the first clause will tell you that both the cause and the effect must be true. Uh, I'm going to go through the, each clause, uh, giving the example later on. Uh, the second clause says that the cause must be sufficient to bring about the effect. And we do that by uh, applying interventions to the cause to see if, if you apply an intervention to the cause and the effects stop existing, then it's very likely that this is uh, a cause, unless uh, uh, given a contingency as well. Um, and the third clause say that the cause must be minimal, which is to stop from you, you finding a cause and then adding more things to the cause that are not exactly related. And that would also could satisfy AC2. So we have a minimality clause here that said your cause must be minimal and whatever is in the excess uh, doesn't have to, cannot be there. Uh, so going back to example, uh, let's evaluate whether green turns equals false is the cause of pedestrian hit equals true. So we have here, the, this is the effect and this is the cause we are trying to evaluate. Uh, a single effect in, in a causal model can have multiple causes. Um, and you can have also uh, the situation where multiple variables can be involved in the cause. But for this example, we only want, well, it, we are only interested in this uh, particular cause here. So AC1 says that both the cause and the effect must be true in our model. Uh, and we are evaluating if this is a cause of this. And as you can see in the model, uh, they are both present. So IC1 is satisfied. AC2 say the cause is sufficient to bring about the effect. In order to verify that, what we do is we apply an intervention where we change the value of the cause to something else. For example, here I'm, I'm applying an intervention such that uh, green turns equals to true. And then you analyze the the structural equations to see whether the effect is still remains. In, the, in this case, we have that uh, pedestrian hit is only true if either of those are true. But since we apply this intervention here, then pedestrian will not be hit. Um, so we, we're saying that if you apply the intervention or the green turns, uh, when the green, green car turns, then the pedestrian will not be hit because also the blue car had turned right. So uh, since neither of the cars turned right, had, uh, st went straight ahead, then the pedestrian uh, was not hit. So this, this uh, negates the effect, which means that the, the cause was sufficient to bring about the effect. So we satisfy also AC2. So we say that this is, um, cause here satisfies AC2 for this uh, effect. And then AC3 says the cause is minimal. Uh, this is to stop, as I said, um, you having extra things in your cause that actually do not do, are not needed to satisfy AC2. For example, the fact that the green turn, uh, green car did not turn, and also there was a dog on the road. Um, the fact that the dog was on the road is not important to a model, uh, only that the fact that the, the green car did not turn right, and then it hit the predation. So in this case, this cause here is minimal because it, there is only one variable involved. Uh, so this, in this case, it's also minimal. So this cause here satisfies all three clauses for this effect. Then we can say that green turns being, being equal to false is a cause for the pedestrian being hit. Uh, as you can see, this is a very simple example, but when you imagine a very a much more complex system with um, dozens or hundreds of variables, then 
it's much harder to 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 try and find out figure out which variable cause uh, what so the idea is that we apply this kind of um, this theory we extend this theory to actual continuous systems and then we apply the same uh, uh, process uh, thinking process um, so our motivation is that uh, in continuous systems the variables they behave in uh, in trajectories, basically uh, continual signals over time. So let's pretend here that we have two signals, acceleration and another signal uh, for the battery. And the combination of, of, uh, of the signals for each variable is what we call a trajectory for the variable over time. So what we do uh, to try and figure out uh, which, was, which caused what is we divide the system in time chunks, in time slices, and then we try to figure out which slice caused uh, caused what. Uh, for example, we can pinpoint uh, within a certain time interval what what caused what um, in our system. Um, in these extensions, uh, causes and effects are described as slices of continuous traje trajectories. So let's say given a trajectory. Uh, which is evaluation, which is a function for time into a evaluation of a set of variables V. So in a system, we have a set of variables and the evaluation, uh, given a, a certain time, a specific time, we can obtain the evaluation for the set of variables, and this is a trajectory. So trajectory is a function of, of time into values, um, which is gonna res it's gonna be something similar to this. Then we can capture capture a slice for this trajectory to a given time interval, for example, in this case, ij. So given a time interval, we can also uh, have a valuation for the variables for this given particular given uh, time interval. And then we apply a projection to focus if you want to focus on a single variable. For example, variable x, we apply uh, this a, a projection to this uh, slice of trajectory here, and then we obtain this particular, the, the valuation for this variable, for this particular variable during this particular time interval. So that's how we can capture specific uh, time intervals for, for, for variables. Uh, then we use this for to represent all causes and effects. Um, for example, uh, we can say, we can evaluate, for example, whether this particular slice for this variable X is a cause for some other for the fact that the other variable y at a different time interval has uh, this other particular variable, and then you use this actual causality to try and find causes for failure, failures um, that were found in in verification techniques. And so now the three clauses are similar. Um, we they still basically remain the same, but now. The context is of the of the, the theory of the Sabbath physical systems, right? Uh, with continuous evaluation over time. Uh, the AC1 says that both the cause and the effects must be true in order for, for this cause to be to be uh, have for the to be the cause of the effect, uh, which in, in practice means that both trajectory slides must be true in the causal model. Uh, AC2 says that the cause is sufficient to bring about the effect. So what you do in this case, we use a search-based approach to try and find um, different values for your uh, for the the trajectory that you have to see whether the effect uh, remains or not. Uh, and the third clause clause is about the minimality. Again, we only want to focus on what is actually needed to be a cause. Uh, I have an example here uh, where I apply this uh, theory of causality. Uh, so let's pretend now that this is, let's consider this other example here, where you have a car with a LiDAR attached to it. Um, so the range of the LiDAR is 20 meters, and there is a pedestrian situated at the end of the road, uh, and the pedestrian is 80 meters away from the car. And this in this particular car, the LiDAR range is halved, if the battery enters critical, critical state. So pretend uh, in this car, assume that in this car there's a battery and when the battery enters a critical state, uh, then the, uh, the range of the light is half to 10 meters. 
And now we want to see, in the case of of a collision, uh, what could be uh, cause if, for example, um, let's pretend, let's assume here that this uh, four uh, sign signals here that comprise the trajectory for this system. Uh, we we don't want to look at certain things, certain variables in your systems. They you might not want to look into them, uh, and they are uh, called in this theory they are called exogenous variables. And there are also endogenous variables, which are the variables you want to link into. Uh, so for these systems, we don't, for example, we don't not we don't want to look into the speed of the car. We assume that the speed of the car is something that is outside of the scope of what we want to look into. And what in what we want to look into is, for example, battery, the brakes, and the, the range of the lidar. Um, so these are our, our endogenous variables, and this is what we look into uh, to see what can be caused. And this is part, this is what forms our causal model. Um, so assume you have this trajectory here and the car is situated at, at the 80 meters mark, uh, the pedestrian is situated at the 80 meters mark. And if the car manages to stop before the 80 meters, then it, not, it will not hit the, the pedestrian. Otherwise, if it goes over the, the 80 meters mark, then it means that it hit the pedestrian, it did not break in time. Uh, so for this trajectory, we see the the value for the battery that it goes down over time. Uh, there is a constant value for the brakes that is uh, for, for this uh, system here initially set to 0 0.2. It's a coefficient that goes from 0 to 1. And we also have the lighter range that starts at 20 meters and then it halves to 10 meters whenever the battery enters the critical state, which is 5% uh, of the battery charge remaining. So we've modeled the system, we obtained this trajectory, and we found that the car hit the pedestrian around the eight seconds mark. Uh, the, and we are trying to find the cause for that. So we want to find the cause for the, the, the effect, which is the car position is about greater or equals to 80. Uh, our strategy, we, we have here two different causes, two possible causes. Um, the first one is about the lighter range. Uh, the lighter range is too small. Uh, we we for AC two, which is the, the the we apply an intervention to uh, to the cause and see whether it brings about change to the effect. So what we did here is we changed the lighter. Uh, instead of going down to ten, uh, it goes up to forty, and this prevents the car hitting the pedestrian. Uh, you can see here in this trajectory that the car position is. Uh, does not reach 80, which means that the car detected the pedestrian in time and it managed to break in time as well and stop before hitting the pedestrian. So we do analyze this using the three clauses that I mentioned earlier, and we check and it checks out that this is actually a cause for the for this effect. Uh, be, the effect being that the car position is greater or equal than 80. Uh, the second cause uh, requires two variables. One is the brakes and the other is the battery. Um, we found using a search based approach um, that the brakes alone are not sufficient to, to for the cars to stop or the battery alone. We are for this actual system for this system, we need both but both the battery and the brakes to be modified in order to for the car to to um, uh, not hit the pedestrian. So if the light range remains the same as in the original, but we intervene in both the brakes and the battery at the same time, then we find out that the car do not, does not hit the pedestrian. Uh, it managed to to, uh, to see the pedestrian uh, and it managed to break it in time. Uh, so the overall strategy is that um, we find a evidence of some failure or, so, or some oversight in the design, then you simulate the system and you obtain the trajectories for the systems. And then we apply a search based strategy to try and find causes for that failure or that design oversight. And then we apply the three clauses, uh, AC1, 2 and 3. And then if if the cause that we found uh, satisfies both the, the three clauses, then we say that this is the, an actual cause. And we designed a process around that uh, that analysis. Um, 
So given a system design, your scenario, your, your scenario, or there, there was a fault and your fault, uh, we select the endogenous variables, with the, which, which are the variables that we are interested in looking at. Uh, you can imagine that in a cyber physical system, there are thousands, uh, hundreds, dozens of variables, uh, and you don't want to look into all of them. You want to look in a particular number of them. Uh, so we, you select the endogenous variable and you build your causal model. And then we apply the, the causal, uh, the search to try and find uh, which specific time chunks, uh, which are the transaction slices, uh, bring about change in the effect. We do that by applying uh, uh, the interventions. And then you, you, you generate the causes at the end of our process. Um, and this process is, we uh, apply this process at, and at the end of a conform, conformance testing approach, um, which basically we find fault is faults using a, a model-based testing strategy. A, we obtain the contra examples then we apply a causality analysis to try and find the causes for this control example. So it, it serves as, as a form of debugging of your system for your system. Uh, the, the verification approach that we use to find the test is uh, based on the model testing, bundle based testing uh, approach. So assume you have your system requirements here. Um, and from the system requirements, you can obtain the system implementation and you can generate the test model as well. Uh, both of them should be based on your system requirements, but they can be developed uh, independently. Uh, then we apply a test case generation algorithm, a multi-objective one to, to, to generate our test cases. And then we use those test cases to both execute the system and simulate the model. And then we compare the outputs of both uh, the system execution and the model simulation. Uh, so from the test model, you generate test cases and then you use test cases to, to both to, to, to execute both models and the system, and then you validate the outputs. Um, so for the multi-objective uh, test case generation, we apply a genetic algorithms approach to try and find inputs or test cases that are more likely to find faults. Uh, so it's what we do is a multi-objective search. We apply notions of diversity, notions of the coverage, and also a notion that try to maximize the distance between the input of your, uh, the output of a system and the output, the ideal output. Uh, and this multiple objective searches, a uh, search generates the inputs which are the test cases in, in this uh, particular scenario here. And with those inputs, we once again execute the system and simulate the model and we validate the output. Uh, the output, uh, the validation of the output is based on a parametric conformance notion. Um, the form conformance notion takes into consideration the time and the value of both outputs. Um, for example, let's see, let's see here in this uh, picture here at the top right. Um, we have two different signals. Um, one of them can represent uh, your implementation and the other can represent your, your, the, the output from the test model. Um, the conformance notion that we use uh, basically tries to find points in either of those that are not within a range from the other. Uh, so, for example, uh, there are two values for the conformance notion. One is about time and the other is about value. And then there is an area that we can be built around each point from this, uh, from the both trajectories. And if the other, if the other signal is not within this area, then we can say that there is, there is, that the both are not conforming. So as a more overall picture here, we have this green and red uh, signals here. Um, and we have this gray area, which is the, your tau epsilon boundary around one of them. Uh, for example, let's say that your your implementation is the green line and your, your test model is the red line. Um, and if one of them leaves the area that is formed, uh, your margin of error area that is formed around one of the signals, then we can say that these two signals are non-conforming because they are too far apart from each other. 
Uh, this conformance notion takes in consideration uh, time and value. So it, which is basically to say that um, because in actual cyber physical systems, uh, it's very common to have uh, latency and it's very common to have some noise. Which is why we don't we try not to find signals that are exactly uh, equal to each other. We try to find signals that are within a certain distance from each other. So we apply this conformance notion as a way to validate our outputs in our proce process here. So if if there is an instance where both signals are not within a certain distance from each other, then we say that there is a fault. And what we do is we have this fault um, this particular at this particular time, and then we run this on a causal analysis to try and find uh, the causes for this fault that are typically generated, uh, that typically have occurred earlier in your trajectory. Uh, we combine here both techniques in a single process uh, where from your system requirements, you have your implementation, you have your test model, uh, you generate test cases, you, you execute both, and you validate the outputs, and if there is a fault, then you can, we can use the or cause analysis to uncover the, the, the reasons behind these failures. And that is the process that I, we have um, been working on in the, the past year or so. Um, we've m submitted a paper recently to, to Tosan and we are waiting for the for the results for the submission. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Hugo. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, Thomas. Hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm just wondering, um, as your Time slicing operations on trajectories feel a little similar to um, signals. Have you considered an extension of this process to causal analysis for temporal logic formula or thought about anything in this direction? Yes, um, actually in, in our implementation, because we have a two implementation of this, we use signal temporal logic for, to describe the, the failures that have been uncovered. So in our verification process, we find faults, then we can describe those faults using signal temporal logic that, for example, a particular va va variable has a particular value at this particular moment in time. This is how we represent the fault. We signal temporal logic for that. And then we try to find changes in the system that make the, this uh, this property uh, not true anymore, and that's how we find the the, clause, the causes for to, that satisfies AC two. Okay, thank you. And how does minimality work in this setting? Because it's not intuitively right. obvious that it is part of the algorithm. Is minimality works by construction because our algorithm. Uh, it starts looking into one variable at a time and then increases to, and then it looks between interactions between two variables at a time, then three variables at a time. And then we found out that looking at more than three variables at a time uh, results in an exponential increase in, in uh, decrease in performance. Uh, it takes a much longer time to do to find the results. So at the moment we uh, stop at three variables at a time basically trying to find uh, a cause that has at most three variables involved in it. So the minimality works because we first look at one variable at a time, and if we, if we don't find a cause for it, uh, we look into two. In the case that we find a cause that has only one variable, then when we go to the next step where we look into two, two or three uh, Ys, then we don't look at the variable that has been found a cause for yet uh, for already, meaning that if a cause has one variable, then we don't look into it for when you're trying to look for causes that has two or more variables. So it's still minimal um, in that sense. So by construction, the algorithm uh, already takes in consideration that it's going to be minimal. OK, thank you. OK, Hector has a question, I think. Hi, well, thanks a lot for the talk. I think it was really interesting. Sorry for being late. It was 
I was late for my previous meeting, but I think you didn't cover what I want to ask in the, in the question. So you were mentioning the automatic test generation process that is guided by the genetic algorithm. And yes. you were mentioning that you have the notions of coverage that probably are used to guide the, 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 the test generation process. So you try to maximize coverage. So my question is, uh, first, if the algorithm has in, into account multiple objectives, uh, like not just coverage or different kinds of coverage or also kinds of well, the real question is if you also have in, in, in mind a uh, notion of diversity when you are trying to generate coverage or inputs. Yes, um, so for the input generation, um, we do use a multi-objective multi search. Um, so one of the coverage criteria we have, because our input generation algorithm is based on a notion of hybrid automata. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the notion of hybrid automata is basically uh, sorry, a, a hybrid automata model contains states uh, within it, and our notion of coverage try to find uh, try to find inputs that execute the system at least once in every state of your system. Uh, this is the coverage notion of e that we use. We also use a notion of diversity, where we try to find inputs. Uh, the inputs are basically signals, right? where to try to find inputs that are different from each other, um, both in shape and also in distance. What does mean shape is, for example, we try to find inputs that are uh, in shapes of, of, of senoids or in shapes of, of linear growth. Uh, so we apply this diversity to our inputs and also so that they are also distant from each other so that they're not uh, very similar uh, uh, in terms of, of, of this space, right? Um, of values. Um, so we do have, we do use multi-objective approach to find inputs, uh, to find the test cases. As for the, as for the search for, for the, the causes, um, it's basically, it's not exactly a multi-objective approach. Uh, the only objective is to try and negate the effect that again is written in signal temporal logic, the, the property. Um, this is the only objective. However, uh, we do consider some extra. Um, we do have some consideration that we have to consider. For example, if a variable uh, is constant, then the search cannot um, modify the variable, the variable of the variable over time. So, because because if a variable is constant, it needs to be constant throughout the execution of the system. Then we can't have a variable that is uh, changing value over the time, right? Uh, so the search takes takes uh, this kind of particulars into consideration when it's doing the search. But as for the objective of this uh, search for causes, uh, it's only one objective, and the only objective is to try and, and negate the effect. So if I understood properly, you don't really have a Pareto form. You have like a hybrid combination of different objectives, and you try to do um, yes, a yes. balance, not between yeah. the, the objective. Oh, okay, okay. We don't consider um, Pareto, yeah, for either of them, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that, that that's also one of the questions that I had. That how do you select the solution in the Pareto? Um, okay, yeah. So I think that that was very clear. Thank you, Hugo. No worries. Thank you. Are there any further questions? I don't see any hands up. Any further questions? Thomas, you have a further question. Just one more question. So. Are the continuous systems you're considering in this work all modeled to be um, deterministic? Yes, it's part of our theory. Um, we only consider the deterministic system. Um, there is actually two constraints. One is that the system must be deterministic, and the other is that there must not be uh, a cycle dependence between variables. Um, so you imagine that I have this picture here. Um, so imagine that uh, in your model, um, for example, here, e, there is two, the variable green collision depends on the variable of green turns and the variable of blue collision depends on the variable of, of blue turn. Uh, what cannot happen in our system is that one variable depends on, on variable A depends on B and variable B also depends on A. Uh, this makes it so that it's in really difficult to find interventions because 
you apply an intervention to one variable, so it's going to change. Uh, you apply an intervention to variable A, it's going to make have an effect on variable B, which is going to then have an effect again on variable A. So your, the intervention that you applied on variable A is basically meaningless. Uh, so we avoid two types of systems. One of them is systems that are non non deterministic and systems that are not a cyclic, not cyclic. Sorry. But can you then have cycles in the continuous dynamics as? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a very strong strategy to find the cycles. Uh, we only say that in your systems you cannot have this uh, sort of dependency. We don't uh, have any kind of algorithm to try and detect if your system highs. We only say that it only works if your it only really works if your system is not cyclic. Um, also, the reason for not allowing for non-deterministic is that we cannot build the, the structural equations if the systems are non-deterministic, meaning that your one variable can only have one value given a certain condition. Uh, if you have a variable that has two potential values given the same um, uh, trace or since under the same conditions, can have two different values, then we cannot build the structural equations, and it, which makes which renders the whole uh, theory uh, invalid, right? But I guess you can model non-determinism by adding extra variables, which represent the choices. Right. Yeah, that could be an option. Yeah, that could be an option. But so far, we limited our models to being uh, deterministic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Jan has a question. Yeah, I have a question about the minimality. Um, so how do you achieve this? <laughs> how do you get this done? On, and what does it mean? How is the minimality uh, defined for your uh, for the approach to several physical systems where you have these uh, slices? Right, so the minimality, I think, uh, let me, I don't think I've got a slide here for that. Um, so the minimality works by construction. I think I tried to explain this to Thomas. Um, so the algorithm to satisfy AC2, we apply a search-based approach that try to find different values for your trajectory slices that make your effect uh, to not hold, right? The effect usually affords. So you're trying to find uh, values for your variables that uh, negate the fault, basically. Uh, so the search works by finding first one slice at a time. Um, and then if this slice is found, then it's definitely minimal because it's only one slice. It's only one intervention. Uh, it, the cause has only one variable and one particular slice. Uh, if we cannot find a cause for only one slice, then we try two at a time meaning that we try to find two slices that if you change them, if you apply two different interventions, if that's going to negate, your, if that's going to invalidate your fault, uh, then uh, then you, both variables uh, at the same time would also be cause. Uh, and we, ask, we guarantee minimality by construction since we only start working from one, uh, one by one, then two by two, then three by three. And then once, if we find that, for example, this variable A at this particular time uh, is the cause, then it cannot, then the algorithm doesn't consider this variable at this particular time as cause for anything, any other for future searches for the rest for the remainder of the search, basically. So you cannot have that variable A at the five second, five to ten seconds interval is cause, and then say that variable A at the five to 10 seconds is cause plus variable B at the uh, 15 to 20 seconds is also cause because um, once we find that for this variable is, that this variable alone is, is a cause, then it cannot be ruled as a cause for any other combination of variables. So it's minimal so the, in that sense. And then the size of the intervals, this is, um, so is there any, any minimality in that or is it just in the, um, like does that the, go into the minimality, the size? Of yeah, the, the, the interval also goes into the minimality okay. uh, because it's almost like we are discretizing the, the 
your continuous uh, system into discrete uh, intervals. Um, so in, in each interval is basically a, it should be minimal. Uh, so if it's the same variable, but it's a different time interval, then uh, the minimality cause is still holds, right? Uh, okay. So it's basically it's by variable, uh, per variable, per interval. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's, I mean, can't this be expensive? Or, I mean, it, it's based it on is. the idea that you have small causes or... Uh... <laughs> It is, it is very expensive actually to run um, in terms of time, right? Uh, it's very, it takes a long time to find causes for, for systems. Uh, we, there have been some suggestions that we can try improve our search to try and find um, either causes more quickly or um, re at least try and reduce the, the amount of time that it's running. But uh, I don't think I have the numbers here in mind, but it can take several minutes to find uh, one cause for, for a small to medium sized system. Okay, but again, the, the interventions on AC2, these only relate to what's in the course, or do these interventions, do you need to check anything else? Only what's in the course. Only what's in the course, okay. So then if you have small causes, it's fine. So if you have larger causes, you would have a problem in AC2 already. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, are there any further questions? Any further questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, then thank you very much, Hugo, and thank you everyone for thank being here. Uh, in two weeks' time, we'll have Gunel Jankirova from uh, University of Lugano, um, who will talk about uh, mutation testing for deep learning systems. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you hopefully in two weeks' time. Thank you.